I've been to prison. I've been homeless. I've been in a satanic cult for a short while. I was arrested for embezzlement, uh, fraud, money laundering. Hi, my name is Pastor Freddy. I'm from Hammanskraw. It's my home. But I grew up in Namibia and then I came back home about 10 years ago or so. Um, I was supposed to pay drivers and then I'll pocket it, put it in my bank account, buy myself a flashy 7 series BM, move into a townhouse, live the life of partying every day and go to work either still drunk or babalas. I grew up from a home of many. We, I grew up in a large family, many siblings. I'm the middle one of my seven siblings. I've got two sisters and five brothers, so we are seven. And I also now at the moment have seven kids. Um, yeah, I have a blended family right now of my own. And uh, I went to school in Namibia, finished my school in Namibia. I studied uh, with UNISA here um, part-time. Yeah, I basically studied uh, marketing and advertising and a bit of accounting and economics as well as uh, company law. I'm a pastor who's been through the most. I'm a pastor, author, a philanthropist, and also an entrepreneur. I'm an inspirational speaker as well. I've been to prison. I've been homeless. I've been in a satanic cult for a short while. They couldn't stand me so they had to let me go. To many it seems like a short while ago. Actually it's a lifetime ago. I lived a reckless life as a young adult. Actually from the time I was 21, 22, 23, um, I found myself drawn into the responsible life of sports and studying and all that into a life of money and parties and wild living, I was introduced to money crime at a young age. I was driving, living the life. By the time I was 21, I had my own place driving a 7 Series BMW. And two years after that, I found myself in deep water facing legal problems. I was arrested for embezzlement, uh, fraud, money laundering. And then shortly after that, I was sentenced to prison term of 12 years, of which I did five years in prison. Now, the kind of lifestyle that I lived, look, I've always had big dreams as a kid. Um, it wasn't easy breaking into starting your own thing, but I worked for a company, a transport company, where I found myself at a very young age working there as an assistant accountant. And then I ended up having access to lots of company money. I was issuing out driver's allowances as in cash. I was paying out... Uh, permit fees and all those things that drivers have to pay as they travel cross-border. I was doing all those things in cash and I decided, you know what, um, I felt my whole journey, I actually started making all these wrong moves based on the anger of feeling the injustice that was done to me where I felt I had a, a shot at a good post that I qualified for, that I was interviewed for within the company and I was told I got the highest score by far in that company, the person who followed me was like 30 points behind, but then they gave it to the person who got the lowest score because, let me not play the racial card, but yeah, because they said he was old enough and mature, and I was only 21 then. But still, I felt like, look, I'm gonna teach them a lesson. I've got access to all this money. So they're gonna give him a salary, I'll give myself an allowance. So every time I pay a driver, I pay myself an allowance. Every time I pay a driver, I pay myself an allowance. That's how it all started. But then eventually I became so reckless in the sense that I would even take five, ten times more than I was supposed to pay drivers and then I will pocket it, put it in my bank account, buy myself a flashy 7 series BM, move into a townhouse live the life of partying every day and go to work either still drunk or babalas. That's the kind of lifestyle I lived. But eventually it caught up to me because every company has an audit and with that audit it came to show that, hey, somebody has got his hands in the cookie jar and there's nobody else but Freddy because he's the only one who has access to the cash office. As the story goes, I was suspended, 
then eventually I had to face a long court case. At the beginning of the millennium, I got sentenced to a 12 year sentence because, okay, like the magistrate said, I thought I was too clever to play with their time with a court time where I could have pleaded guilty because all the evidence pointed to me, all the paperwork had my handwriting on it. So he gave me 12 years sentence and then he suspended three of which I was left with nine. Of the nine, I did five. I was actually released on parole, basically good behavior. So that's how I did shorter than what I was sentenced for. And being in prison itself was not easy having to go through all that, knowing that now I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of friends and I had to pull through all those five years with nobody ever coming to see me except my sister, my mother, yeah, my close family, my siblings rather, let me put it that way. Um, it wasn't easy. It was tough. It was challenging. It was heartbreaking. But I had a choice to make whilst in prison that I looked at all the people around me, their characters, I listened to them and then I thought to myself, either I stay in this place, I become one of them, or I become the better version of myself. I get back to the big dreamer that I was, build myself up, research and study as much as I can, and then when I come out, I start my life from scratch. That's how prison went for me, getting out, okay fine, I got out on parole, but before I even got out, I was a year in my sentence actually, when I had a a vision. That's where I got my calling when I was in prison as a pastor, but I didn't start immediately. But the vision is where I'm sleeping and then it's like I hear an explosion. There's lightning and smoke everywhere. So I thought maybe some prisoners had escaped using hand grenades and stuff. But then along the way, the lightning and smoke and all that started to change into golden light that is so smoothing, soothing and comforting. And then the thunder that I was hearing, the big bang started to turn into a voice and I could hear this voice talking to me and showing me how he saved me, how I was saved, how I could have died at this nightclub. I know I remember the nights where a fight would break out and I'll be involved, how I could have been arrested for this, how I could have killed someone and been to prison. And now my court case, I fought it with everything I had. I, I, I'm not always afraid to tell people I had been to Sangomas to fight this court case. I had even tried to buy my way out of it and all these that work for other people didn't work for me because it was all in God's plan. I finished my, my, rather I was given parole, I came out of prison and then that is where now the real challenge takes, the real challenge gets. Because um, prison actually set me free from the dream life that I was living, which was actually basically that a dream, to reality, to face life as a reality. When I came out of prison, it wasn't easy because everywhere you, you knock on the doors, um, my case was televised, my case was in the, in the papers back then, there wasn't Facebook or anything, so <laughs> um, it's not that much on uh, social media, but knocking on doors where everybody that sees you says, oh, you are that Freddy, you just came out of prison, right? Sorry, we can't help. There's a job opening. I have to fill in a form. I have to say I have a criminal record. Sorry, we can't help. Apply for a business loan. Sorry, we can't help. So now, the thing is, why am I going into prison to be rehabilitated, to be reformed, if society doesn't want to give me a second chance? It's like now I'm coming out to be sentenced again for the same crime by society. Now, in this case, I did my five years in prison. I'm coming out and I'm being sentenced now for life. That's how bad it was. So it was a struggle getting back on my feet, but I did get a breakthrough. There was a financial institution that gave me a small loan, started a business of my own, transporting freshwater fish, selling it directly to my customers. I eventually opened up a shop before, just two weeks before my wedding, before I got married to my first wife, I had an accident and my bucky was crashed beyond repair. I came out unscathed, but that was the beginning of the end of my business. And then the thing is, with life it's funny because as my business started, I started making money. I forgot about 
how people had abandoned me and they came back again. And as soon as I had the accident and my business started to crash, I found myself being alone again, fighting through all these debts on my own. So it was a lot of pressure not being able to pay rent, not being able to put food on the table, and also facing the stigma wherever you are going, fingers are being pointed. And then there's always that thing, I used to tell people uh, back, in, back then, when I, before I even went to prison, when they, are, when they are talking about when you come out of prison, the game keeps calling you, the game keeps calling you, I'll tell them, come on man, what game? It's all, all in your head. But in actual truth, the game that's calling them, it's uh, the fact that all doors are closed and then only one door opens for you to go back into crime. But then I thought, that is not me. I made a mistake. As a young adult, I had a poor judgment call. I ended up in prison, but in absolute sense, I'm not a criminal. Nobody is born, is born a criminal. So I decided I'm gonna stay on the straight and narrow, no matter how hard it is. It was hard at home. Things fell apart at home. Okay, the first marriage fell apart. I moved out, uh, came to Joba. I feel, look, that's the right place for my dreams. I'm a writer. I wanted to break into media. And there were people that would say, now come work with us. Took the little cash that I was able to raise to come this side. Before I even came to Joburg, there was also the issue with the stigma where you become the usual suspect. Everything that goes wrong, even if I pass an ATM, obviously, and then that ATM breaks, they'll think I'm the one maybe who tried to take money out of it. But everything that went wrong, my finger would be there, uh, I mean a finger would be pointed in my direction. There was a time I had to fight a court case, I was locked up for three months and then the trial took another 18 months before it was thrown out of court to show that I was wrongly uh, locked up. And then not long after that, um, somebody tried to sell me a stolen car. I was not interested anyway, but tracing the steps of the car through which, the path through which it went, my name popped up in there and they decided I'm the kingpin behind that car that was taken off the showroom with zero kilometers on it. I was locked up for two months. Look, I decided, look, where I am, it's like anything that goes wrong. The next thing is people will start disappearing. They'll say, Freddy did it, Freddy did it. Let me just go and pursue my dreams. Let me move to Jobek where nobody knows me, where nobody knows about me. I'm just a nobody, though I knew people around here that says, okay, fine, you can come. We'll see how we set you up. But as I came, I just kept losing the little money that I had on me and ended up on the streets of Johannesburg. I lived at the corner of Pritchard and Small for the most part of 2013. It was not easy. It was hard. And I had strangers who are now like family to me because everybody had turned their backs on me. I had people that I was close to that I had once helped, you know, people that would come and cry to you that I've got this and these problems. You don't even tell your wife, you just go under the mattress, somewhere in a shoebox, you pull out a 50,000 rand and give it for them to go fix their 30,000 problem with a bonus on top. I'm living in the street and I'm begging, please, I need a place just to lay my head and I'm being told this is Jobek. It's everyone for himself and God for all of us. I was like, okay, maybe I deserve this. Maybe there's something that I did that's very, very bad to the point that God would let me go through all this. Strangers started reaching out to me. Um, there are people that would just say, hey, uh, we see you around here on the street. Every time we come down the flats from the building to go do something, you're around here and we can see you don't belong here. Come upstairs for a warm plate of food. Then I'll go and people like that, they've become like family to me. Um, a taxi driver who took me off the street that just decided, look, you've been here for too long and when I talk to you, I can see you don't belong here. Nobody belongs on the street, but yeah. I, he took me and gave me a shack, gave me the push I needed to start getting back on my feet by putting me in that shack, providing me with transport. That is how I got out of the street, but it wasn't easy. You know, when the devil starts to push you in a certain direction, when he starts to set you up, it was a time now where every corner I turn, somebody is telling me, look, there's no hope for you. You know, people do kill themselves. There are people, other people, just go back home. Go back to your mother. Go, go to your family. Do something. Or, you know, at least your family, if you're there and you are poor in your mother's house, it's different. But here you are living on the street. Nobody wants to help you. My weight had dropped from 95 to about 60 or so. So I started feeling it in me. Let me just rather 
ended. I mean, I had my, my son, uh, he was six then. My girl, my baby girl was just almost a year. Everything I touch turns to ashes instead of gold. I'm trying this, I'm trying that, nothing works. I'm putting ideas on the table. People are taking my ideas and running with them and they're making money out of it. And I'm here stuck on the street. So I went on top of the building where I used to stay downstairs. Um, it's opposite the Methodist Church in Joburg, near the High Court. I went there on the rooftop that is on the 14th floor and I looked down and I decided I'm going to end my life right here. Because what am I good for? I can't provide for my kids. So I'm far from them. Nobody will even notice that I'm gone. I made up my mind I'm going to throw myself there. Very early in the morning, I snuck up. I looked down and I decided this is it and I'm going to throw myself. And then the same voice that I had when I was in prison, when I had that vision, came so strong, I could feel the presence like somebody putting a hand on my shoulder and asked me, is it how you want to be remembered for the rest of whoever knows your life? Is it how you want people to remember you, your children? Is it how you want them to remember you? And I started debating why is this not working why and actually why are you showing up only when i want to kill myself when i ask you for money when i ask you for this you're not showing up i started having that argument with the lord he said look i'm i am preparing you for your purpose so you're gonna speak to people you're gonna give people hope that's why i called you from the time you were in prison i've been with you all the way and if you want to cancel that and run away like jonah you'll still find yourself busy serving my purpose because I will let you jump, but I will not let you die. I am life. I am in you. And you are going to jump this 14-story building and break your bones, but you are going to be there, a bag of bones, preaching, not necessarily, necessarily preaching, but sharing your story with people so that those who are lost, those who are hopeless, may also be inspired and not give up. That is how... I changed my mind on killing myself. But if, if I backtrack a little bit, when I was angry and miserable, because even church people were not actually no longer interested in helping me out. I had situations uh, where I would secretly put money in a church account. And a pastor would say, Hey, Fre Brother Freddie, can you please stand up? We want to pray for you. I say, for what? No, no, we know you are the one who, who transferred money into the church account. And I say, no, it's not me, because that's not my style. But then when things fell apart, they also just turned their backs on me. And yeah, I lost everything. Not even one of them would bother come and knock on my door to ask if my wife and ch uh, ch uh, children have anything to eat. So I became angry with the Lord. That's where I made a mistake of not separating God from individuals or groups in church. I became angry with the Lord and I decided, you know what? I thought there's love in the church. There's none. I'm going to move to the satanic cults where I know there's no love from the devil. I know enough about the devil, but I'm going to go there, join them, make money and go to hell after that. I don't care as long as I can leave that money for my kids. That was my attitude towards that. I had researched them. There are secret societies. Actually, I met somebody who's practicing uh, Eastern religions that met me randomly, or rather I met him or he met me randomly and spoke over me and told me everything that I went through just from that single first encounter. And he told me, I know somebody who can help you. That's how he guided me. Because contrary to what people believe and all these joint Illuminati adverts that you see uh, be on, on social media and on light poles and all that you join by introduction to somebody who already is inside that's how I was introduced to a cult here you got that's where I saw that you know you, you're driving past mansions where you think it's just a luxury mansion inside it's actually a satanic temple with black walls and everything I joined that cult we did they trained me as far as they could they prepared me for even the deeper rituals and all those things. And um, the whole idea was, once I'm in, promise me that nobody dies because I'm here for my loved ones. I want to leave money for my kids. I don't care if the devil decides to take my soul after two years, three years, five years. I don't care. All I want is to leave lots of money for my kids. 
but it was not going to be like that because every step of the rituals or the initiation that we did, it was like, I feel the presence of God next to me, showing me if they can do that, if the devil can do that, how much more can I do for you? And then he would sabotage that ritual and I'll be more angry with God to say, look, I'm done with you. I'm moving in this direction. Stop following me and blocking my things. Stop following me and blocking my things. But still, all the way up to the point until where the Sri Lord or Grandmaster of that cult decided, you know what? You are busy effing up this whole process. We're going to start from scratch. And now I'm telling you straight, you have to bring us blood. Otherwise, you'll die within two weeks. He used to call me. He used to threaten me. They would tell me where... They check in the mirror, where are my kids? You describe my kids directly, how they look, what school uniform they are wearing, and where am I sitting? We can see you are sitting at a sort of a coffee shop or a restaurant, and that time I was sitting outside uh, McDonald's in Joburg CBD. You're sitting at sort of a coffee shop or restaurant, talking to someone, and I'm like, I start checking around. Maybe he's standing somewhere. So they tried to put the fear in me, to go back but I told myself look either way if I don't go back my children are gonna die and then I'll also die if I go back I have to sacrifice my children so what do I have to lose so I stayed away I stayed away through all the threats and they gave me two weeks to leave and then long after that I realized that I actually <laughs> it's now over a year that I've lived okay I'd move back to Hamas crawling I was busy cleaning a yard. I was staying in a shack in Amanskral, <clears throat> where we used to have our, our cell groups and Bible study. I was busy cleaning the yard one morning. I heard a voice ask me, so whose blood was that? I was like, what do you mean? Because I know the voice. And this is the voice of the Holy Spirit. Whose blood was that? Then immediately it clicked, because they, they used to threaten me and say, now you are really dead, because when, when we look in the mirror to look for you and your children, we just see a lot of blood. Because... Usually in rituals, before that you are actually dead to the physical spirit, they take your blood in the spirit. So they told me that they've already taken my blood and the children's blood. In the meantime, it was the blood of Christ that they, they were seeing in the mirror that had covered me and my kids. That's how they were never able to trace me or attack me after then. So since then, I lived a little bit in fear until I went to a psychic to go ask, how am I going to die? <laughs> and, and, and that old lady in Pretoria, Queenswood, she told me, the moment you walked in here, the Lord told me not to take your money because you don't have a cent on you. You borrowed this 300. God told me this has never happened before. God told me he loves you. He forgives you. Go back and help other people by telling them your story. Again, the Lord told me that. So in all that, now I was already, um, not long after that, I met my second wife. And then we threw all these years that we were together and blah, blah, blah. And I was an angry man. I didn't realize that everything that I went through started to shape me and to shape the kind of man and pastor that I was becoming until not so long ago when I had an epiphany that, hey, you are going down the wrong road very fast, thinking you're doing the right things. And that is how I am where I am today, talking to men, talking to people. Um, I am a pastor. I was called. I was ordained. But I don't have a church per se, per se, because I do my talking by being invited to other churches. But mostly my ministry, my outreach is homes. In, in communities, people that don't actually get to even go to church, people who really need the Lord but don't get to go to church. That's how I get there. And so, yeah, my name is Pastor Freddy. I've been through the most.